My name's Seb and I'm speaking about um, decision making and performance analysis today. Um, I know some of you video your games, some of you might not and hopefully it might give you a bit of motivation to um, video it and give you an idea of what you should be looking at and how you feedback the information to players. Um, firstly I'd like to thank Ken um, Rugby for inviting me here today. I really like um, being able to share my experiences and try and help where I can. Um, so a bit about my experience um, to date, so why I'm here. So I finished my university University degree at the University of Brighton did sport and exercise science. I looked for about a year for sport jobs and if any of you know and have done the similar thing they're so hard to come by. Um, you can't really um, you can't really find it unless you have some sort of postgraduate study or you go through a year's internship with no money. So I, I went down the route I, I wanted to try and find some postgraduate study and what a lot of teams are doing now is they're trying to get postgraduate studies attached to professional teams so obviously the professional team can guide the, the research that they want to get on answers for and then the university get um, some really good research out of it. So I did that, I managed to get one at the University of Waikato and I also worked with the Chiefs, um, the Super Rugby team over there at the same time, so I was full time with them for two years as a sort of decision making advisor but I also did performance analysis and then my PhD focused on um, improving on field decision making of our players. Um, as with Debbie, I'm right at the end stages, I've handed in my thesis so I've just got um, a few people to come back at me and question it and tell me if it's good or not. Um, at the Chiefs I made some really good contacts, fortunately I was put in contact with Eddie Jones, he really liked the stuff I was doing over there and then got me on staff here to work up um, in the build up to the World Cup and fortunately uh, a bit after that as well. Um, and I'm also working, don't hold it against me, for Tunbridge Juddians as their first team um, defence coach and also looking at their decision making so hopefully I can sort of draw on some of my experiences from that high performance but also bring it down to a much lower level where I don't have a huge amount of exposure to the players and that might be um, more relevant to you. I'd like to say right at the beginning here that I'm not really going to talk about much about what the England England team do. Um, so if any of it contradicts what you've heard from the RFU, I'm, look, I'm talking about my research, what I did over at the Chiefs and how I've implemented that at Tunbridge. So Brendan Venter, he said decision making is the hardest part of rugby and when you think they're having collisions like car crashes, um, they're in scrums where I've seen people pass out through the, through the pressure and stuff like that. Um, to say decision making is the hardest part, initially when I started all my studies, I was like, well, that sounds pretty baffling, but the more I've gone through it and the more I've spoken to coaches, this is the hardest part really of the game to change. You can improve their physical capabilities, you can probably improve their nutrition to a point, um, but decision making is that really hard one, especially to measure and also to improve. Um, so obviously the main question and why probably a lot of you are here today is how can we improve our players decision making um, and I want to look at a model um, called the information processing model and it's basically um, looking at the brain as if it's a computer so information is inputted so if it was a computer you type away on your keyboard that would be processed by the computer so by the Intel core processor whatever it is um, do all the computing behind it and then an output would be produced which might be information on the screen might be stuff printed out and we can look at our decision making in the exact same way Way. and it's really important to look at our decision making this way because we can start tweaking different things at different stages through the decision making process. Um, so I'll say before I go any further, I try and limit as much um, text on the slides as possible and one way I'm going to try and do that today is by using emojis. Um, maybe have a think while I'm going through it about why I'm using emojis and then in the second half when I move on to the sort of performance analysis type stuff, um, you can give me some answers as to why you think I'm using them and I'll, I'll, I'll give my reasons. So our inputs, so like the computer where we're typing away, our inputs, what's coming from our senses, so what we're seeing in front of us, the picture, what we're hearing from our teammates and also what we're feeling. Obviously what we're feeling is a bit of a strange one but obviously if you catch the ball in a bit of an odd position that might change the way you process the information, you might carry the ball rather than passing it because that ball's in that weird position. Um, the process, that's our thinking about what the best, de best decision is based on the input and that's, um, so when, when we're processing the input information in front of us, um, that's paired to our memory, so when we were in a previous situation like this before, what decision did we choose, was it right, was it wrong, um, but it's also paired to emotion, so if you're really pumped up before a game, your decision might not be to pass, it might be to go and run hard because you want to get that aggression out, and I'll, I'll draw back on that at the end. And then the output is, um, is the movement, the decision and, and what um, happens because of it. As you can see I've, I've started to become a bit creative with the emojis to try and um, sell a picture. 
Um, so like I say, we're going to go through some of these things and look at, in the input stage, what can we tweak to improve our players' decision making? In the processing bit, what can we tweak? And then the output, that's basically down to you. That's the movement. I I'm not going to talk about that today. So at the input stage, these are the things I'm going to look at. So scanning behaviors up at the top, I'll talk about that. Communication and then positional roles. So um, how can we really aid certain decision makers by having other people look at other things or feed in different sort of information so we're not having one player having to make a decision based on huge, huge amounts of information. So scanning behaviors first. So there was a study back in sort of 2013, I believe, around football, and what they looked at was how many times um, players searched their environment. So when they weren't in possession of the ball, how many times did they yeah, search their environment, have a look at the picture, see where the space was, see where their teammates were, and all that sort of stuff. And they measured that by the number of times they turned their heads. So if you're in possession, I'm out of possession, they'd look at this player and they count how many times he looked at the ball, he looked away, looked at his teammates, looked at the space, looked back at the ball, and so on and so on. And what they found was that the top players, so the players who won things like FIFA World Player of the Year, um, Premiership Player of the Year, etc., etc., turn their heads significantly more than those players who didn't. So it basically shows that that's a critical determinant of decision making, that you need to turn your head, which, which sounds obvious, but you need to turn your head, you need to be looking at that picture in front of you, and you need to be constantly trying to um, keep up to date with that changing picture. So how do we relate that to rugby? So obviously a lot of players um, might just look straight in at the ruck when they're receiving the ball. Um, when they're in defensive line, they might similarly look at the ruck and w watch for when the ball's coming out. But we really want those players to be scanning, seeing the picture in front of them, seeing it changing, etc. So let's have a look at an example from England. So if we look at, I think it's George Ford there. Just a bit closer. So as you can see, before he's even received the ball, there's so much scanning going on, putting his players into the right positions, looking at um, where his teammates are, looking at where the space is, etc. Um, so this is something that I started doing at the Chiefs. So three seconds before the ball was passed from the ruck, I looked at certain players and how many times they turned their heads. And although it was a small sample because it was just before I returned back to England, um, there was sort of promising research to say that the more times players turn their head, the better decision they ultimately made. So like I say, the application for rugby is while we're getting into position, while we're migrating into those positions, we need to be looking up, not just sort of running head down to get into the position. It obviously is easy at the beginning of the training, but uh, sorry, the beginning of the game when we're fatigued, it's a lot harder, but those are the things that we need to sort of emphasize. Um, get into that position as quickly as possible so we can turn and then scan um, and make sure we have our head on the swivel. So that's what the terminology was of the Chiefs. Yeah, we're not just looking in at the ruck, we're not just looking at one person, we're trying to scan as much as possible. And and then what becomes really important following that is we're not just scanning for the sake of it, we then need to be directing our attention to the relevant cues which is going to be most informative for us to make our, our decision. So next thing I'm going to talk about is um, communication, so how can we tweak this to make our calls um, more memorable and um, certain cues to stand out. So I put this in, I thought it was quite cute, uh, sheepdog on the first day of um, on, in the field. And if you have a look on the right, there's um, the most popular sheepdog names. Is there anything you notice about those names? One yeah, one syllable. So it's obviously very similar to rugby in the heat of battle. Um, when stuff's going on, you want to be able to get that message across really quickly. And we used to call these buzzwords. So for example, at the Chiefs, we had a buzzword for cash, which meant I want the ball, and that superseded everything else, and that was our key buzzword. So you might have a certain call to go through this move, but if there's space in front of me, cash, I want the ball, that was the most important thing on our, on our training plan. <coughs> Another thing with um, the communication, so I'm not sure about youth players, but in the professional game, the playbooks are, are vast, page upon page upon page, call upon call upon call. So how do you make those calls memorable and make sure they remember um, everything they're going through? And one way you can do that is by using analogies. So one of them um, at the Chiefs was a, a rainbow pass, and I'll show you an example of this. Hopefully the video works. Oh yeah, there it is. 
yeah, so that's the rainbow pass. So obviously um, the rainbow um, is an analogy for the type of pass and the arc on the pass. And obviously that makes it a lot more easy to remember than something random like, a, I, don't, I can't even think, but something random. And it makes it much more memorable. So when you hear that, it just clicks. Okay, I know what a rainbow pass is. I can execute that um, with no conscious thought in the heat of the battle. Um, other things that we did at the Chiefs, we had our kicking strategy that was based on um, golf shots. So a long kick downfield was a driver. Um, a grubber along the floor was a putter. Um, a box kick was a wedge based on that um, arc of the shot. And the last thing is um, emotive language. So like I say, when we're processing um, the inputted information, that's paired to our emotions. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that I brought in at Tunbridge, a bit of a long-winded story, but bear with me, is um, a castle call, so Tunbridge Castle, so it had some sort of resonance with us. Um, we had real issues at the beginning of the season with competing at the breakdown too much, and whether the referee is not too good or whether the breakdown um, decision-making wasn't good or the skill set wasn't good, we, we, got, we conceded so many penalties, and it, it absolutely crippled us. Um, so I came up with the call of Castle and the idea was in this period of play if we're under the pump or we're in our own half and we're defending, um, we'll call Castle call and it meant you protect your castle with everything you have and you wouldn't do anything risky that would risk your castle being sieged or, or whatever. So Castle um, was brought in and it had really good uptake and players understood the meaning and it was basically around um, if there was a real opportunity to compete in the breakdown, then do it. If it's 50-50, don't even think about putting your head in there. Um, about bringing really good line speed, about not missing any tackles and just defending that castle with your life, basically. Um, first game, we did that against Barry St. Edmunds. It was the last period of play before half time. Barry St. Edmunds were currently scoreless. Um, we ended up defending for 4 minutes 50 seconds, which I think is pretty unheard of. Um, 39 def phases defended, and the end result was a turnover one. And it basically, like, you can obviously put that down to Castle, um, you can put it down to the players, but um, we built on this through the season and it, it was really helpful for us. So that emotive language, if it can um, resonate with something and change your decision making slightly, then it can be really helpful. And then positional roles. Um, so how can different people look at different things um, to aid certain players' decision making? So Clive Woodward, when he was in charge of England, he had a TCT um, scanning um, terminology, which is basically you scan from the touchline to the crossbar to the touchline. So you look at the whole pitch. Um, far be it for me to um, criticise Clive Woodward, but we had um, at the Chiefs, we decided that wasn't appropriate for all players. We don't want all players looking at everything. Rather, we could split it up into certain zones and certain positions, so certain people are looking for certain things, and then key information is um, fed into that. those key decision makers, for example, the 10. <clears throat> so for example, our 10, he'd be looking predominantly in front of him once he's receive the ball, looking for uh, reading those body shapes, looking for spaces to put people through the holes. Um, our 12 and 13 will be looking for weak shoulders, holes that they can run into, um, or any kicking space in behind the line. And then our wings out there, they'd be looking more at that big picture, so looking for any mismatches, overlaps, um, or any kicking space in behind that line. And then obviously the important thing is that um, these players would feed in really succinct information, so really clear information to that 10, so he can make a decision um, based on that. So moving on to our processing. So things I'm going to look at is firstly um, a decision-making order, um, and then we're going to look at if-then. So if-then is basically a relationship between cues and um, the most optimal response. So for example here, um, the if would be whether the traffic light's red or green, and the then would be whether we go or stop. So if the traffic light's red, then we stop. So that's obviously a really simple one. In rugby, it might be something else. It might be if the wing comes up really quickly, then we kick in behind them. Um, and then consciousness. Um, so that's going to... The consciousness stuff is probably going to take up the majority of this talk because that's what a lot of my research was on at the Chiefs. Um, a lot of the stuff that, uh, sorry, a lot of my research at the university and a lot of the stuff I did at the Chiefs was around um, consciousness. And for young players, it, it's, it's really helpful. So decision making order to begin with. So typical decision making, I say typical, it's not always typical, but um, suboptimal decision making would be a player receives a ball, he then looks up, he then makes his decision and executes that decision. What we really want players to be able to do 
is um, make as many of their processes, so um, a lot of their decision making processes before they even receive the ball. So um, if the nine's over there and he's about to pass the ball, rather than um, just looking at him, catching the ball, making our decision, linked in with that scanning stuff, we want him to be looking at the picture in front of him, making a decision really early, and then he'll then receive the ball. And again, he'll have a look and he'll have a quick think. If the picture stayed the same, then he'll execute that decision. If the picture's changed slightly, then obviously he'll have to change his decision. But what often happens in decision making is you'll have your top decision, which you think is best, and then you'll have the next decision, and then the next decision, and they'll go down in order. Um, so obviously if the picture changes, then you just go to your second um, decision. So let's look at an example of this. Let's have a look at Owen Farrell. Again, look at that scanning behavior before he's received the ball. So as you can see, before he's received the ball, does all his scanning. Um, at this point, I reckon he's probably made his decision. He's still scanning the environment to see if the picture's changing in front of him. And then once he receives the ball, look how quickly he actually makes his decision from there. So there's no waiting around. There's no um, like long deliberation once he's received the ball. So a lot of that decision making is done before he even receives it. Um, so our processing, so that's our if-then rule. So those relationships between the cues and how and what the optimal decision for that is. Um, so if we look at this player here, he's got a picture in front of him. There will be then if rules, if then rules as to what the best decision would be for him. Um, so I've, I've given an example here. So if he sees that these defenders are spaced too wide, then his best decision might be to attack around the corner and have these two um, forwards off him running hard into those spaces. But the difficulty comes when players don't know that if then rule. And this is something that the, the coaches of the Chiefs came up to me once and basically this exact situation and said, this player here, he's not seeing the picture in front of him and he's not making the right decision. Seb, why is that? And that's obviously, uh, there's a million answers for that. So it could be one that this player, he was a young player, he doesn't have the confidence to make that decision. And he's, he doesn't have the confidence to overcall other calls um, to make that decision. It could be that um, he doesn't back his skill set to get around the corner and back his decision making to put someone through a hole. It could be um, that he doesn't actually see that picture in front of him. He doesn't understand that those players are actually spaced quite wide. He just looks at it and goes, I'm, I, I don't know, they're not spaced differently to what I've seen previous. It could be that he does see those players are spaced quite wide, but he doesn't know that then rule. So he sees their space wide but he doesn't know the best response for that would be to attack around the corner and then have those two forwards coming off him if that makes sense so one way you can do this or one way you can um, uh, try and change this with your players is you can show them pictures like this um, might be videos that you see from games Saracens games where you just pause them video it off the, off the TV and go what would you do in this situation and then players might come up with certain answers and then you might question them and say well did you see this did you see this would you think this would be a better response um, another way that I try and do it in defence is I'll quite often stand behind our wingers at Tunbridge and I'll just talk to them while they're running around I'll just I'll just mirror them and shadow them and just say um, are, are we numbers up now or are we numbers down should we be coming hard or should we be coming soft in our line speed and you can just have that conversation and they can they can talk back to you at the same time and you can get a really good understanding of what they're thinking what they're seeing and all that sort of stuff and then obviously once they've finished that set you can have a quick conversation with them for 30 seconds and go yeah that was a really good decision or you probably could have come a bit harder up in your line speed there. Um, so consciousness, as I say, this is going to take up um, like a fair amount of, of the talk because I, I think it's really important for young players and I'm very passionate about it. Um, so before I go any further, basically you can look at decisions in two ways. So you've got intuitive decisions or deliberative um, decisions and it's on a continuum. So obviously it can be anywhere in the middle and anywhere in between. So an intuitive decision would be when you have no time to make your decision. So I'm anticipating you doing a sidestep. It's really quick. If I think for too long, I've missed the tackle. Where deliberative would be... Um, so you've got a bit of time to make your decision. So you've just been awarded a penalty. Um, you have a think, should we go to the corner? Should we kick at the goal? So you have a bit of time. Um, the issue comes 
when there's a decisional misfit. So we use a deliberate strategy for an intuitive decision. So if I'm anticipating you doing a sidestep, as I say, I think about it too long, I deliberate about it, I've then missed the tackle. And what a lot of the research says is, not only will you be slower at making your decision, but you'll also be less accurate. And there's research that shows that there's something called take the first heuristic, where basically you'll make a decision and it'll just be the first thing that pops into your mind. <clears throat> and researchers have gone through and they've looked at um, these decisions and they've said, right, in this situation, write down the five things you think would be a good decision and do them in order. And they put their first decision would be this, then this, then this, then this. And what they found was around 80% of the time, their first decision was actually the best decision. So really, you're, you're, um, you want your players to be intuitive with their decisions um, and trust their their intuition because it is most likely going to be right so like I say that deliberate strategy is just gonna um, yeah not not be helpful to the players so like I say if you deliberate too long on a sidestep that's probably what's gonna happen um, so the key message that conscious processing so that deliberation of intuitive decisions is detrimental to performance um, so just to add a few more terms uh, on top of that, um, so as you go through the learning process, you go through a cognitive stage, which is very conscious. That's when we're an absolute beginner at, um, at a skill, um, like decision-making skills. So when sidestepping, it'd be very conscious. I'm looking at their feet, I'm looking at their shoulders, I'm looking at their hips, I'm looking at their head to try and get as many cues as possible. Um, you then go into an associative stage, which is more um, of an intermediate stage. So you start to understand the cues, um, cues and outcomes, so that if-then rules. Um, it become a bit less conscious and then your autonomous um, stage of learning would be um, completely unconscious. Um, you can do it in your sleep, you're not thinking too much about it. And the issue comes when we deliberate, oh sorry, so it goes from very conscious in the cognitive stage to completely unconscious in that um, autonomous stage where we can do it in our sleep. And the issue comes when we're under pressure and when we deliberate too much on a decision, we basically go back to that cognitive stage. So rather than the um, decision making being really uh, flowing and unconscious, we go back to that cognitive stage where we have to think really uh, a lot about it. And I can think of examples where I was at Chiefs training, I had 10 Nana Williams standing in front of me and he was going to step me and I thought oh fuck I don't want him, I don't want him to step me so, so I'm going to watch him really carefully have a look at his cues as much as possible and make sure I make a good decision and then I'd end up just standing there as he stepped past me when if I used an intuitive decision making style and I didn't think about it too much it might have been I'm, I'm not saying it would but it might have been um, a better decision so if we look at an example here um, so this is a player called Henry Paul um, he now coached for Canada. I think, I'm not sure what club he played for, but I think this was his second game for England, perhaps. And this basically shows where he consciously processes his decisions too much. He basically goes back to a beginner stage of learning. He can't throw a pass. Um, his decision's are awful. And I'll show the video because it speaks for itself. decision and we know he's a great player because he's got to that level where he can play for England so why did he regress back to that cognitive stage of learning it's probably because he, he consciously controlled a lot of his decisions thought about it too much when actually he should have just gone and played you're a good player go and do what you normally do for your club but obviously that wasn't the case substitute for 24 minutes 
Um, so the researcher's answer is we can avoid the conscious, um, the build-up of conscious knowledge in this cognitive stage, and then when they get to that autonomous stage and they can do it completely unconsciously, if pressure comes on, they can't revert back to that cognitive stage because they don't have the conscious knowledge to f fall back on. So, for example, if I was um, anticipating a side step on you and I never knew about all the um, movements around shoulders, hips, feet, etc then I couldn't revert back to that when I'm under pressure. I'd just purely be um, intuitive, if that makes sense. And it, it sounds strange, but it, it does work and it's been shown over and over again in research, both in decision-making and in movement skills. Um, so this is, I'm not going to talk too much about studies, but this is one that's um, very interesting. Um, so they basically looked at how players anticipate tennis shots. So they'd have a video of someone playing a tennis shot in front of them and they'd have to say whether it went to their right or it went to their left. Um, they'd also, so there's 33 intermediate tennis players, they'd have a training phase where they'd basically just watch these videos and they'd be given three different instructional techniques. One of those would be very conscious, so giving them lots of technical knowledge, and one would be completely unconscious, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, um, they do a massive bank of those with the instructional techniques. Um, they then have a test where they'd see how much they learn, and then they then have a pressure test where they'd see how much they learn, but they'd also put them under pressure to see how they respond. Um, so the three different learning styles was explicit instructions. So for example, they'd say, look at the player's hips and shoulders, see how little rate they rotate and compared to other shots. So this is for a drop shot. So they give that information to, a, to a one group of players. They give guided discovery to another group of players where they basically just say, look at these regions, these will be informative. You make up your own um, if-then rules to those. And then there was discovery learning where they basically went, just do it. Yeah, there's no, no instruction. Just do it and see how much they learn. So what was the results? So the rate of initial learning, the explicit group where they're given lots and lots of information, they learn very quickly, as maybe you'd expect. The guided discovery group um, also learn very quickly. And the discovery learning group, because they were given no instruction, they learn pretty slowly. Um, the conscious knowledge accumulated, so basically how many um, rules they could report, so what's the relationship between the shoulder rotation and the shot type, etc. Um, explicit instruction, because they were given so much technical knowledge, they got a lot, which is bad. Um, guided discovery didn't, get, um, didn't build up a lot of conscious knowledge, and got discovery learning, as you'd expect, got even less. Um, and then the performance under pressure, which is obviously the important thing for us as coaches. Um, the explicit group, um, they really fell down under pressure and their initial learning um, dropped back to what it was previously. The guided discovery group, their performance under pressure was unaffected, and the discovery group, um, the performance was unaffected. And the reason for that is, based on that stuff I spoke previously, they reverted back to that cognitive stage of learning. Um, sorry, that, yeah, that cognitive stage of learning because they consciously processed their decision making because they've been given so much conscious knowledge. So obviously <clears throat> what the research will say is we want to use a guided discovery approach. Let's avoid giving lots of conscious information to our players because it's only going to um, be detrimental to them when it gets to um, performance under pressure or under time constraints, etc. Um, so how do we do that? It's not an easy task, is it? If we're teaching a new pass, if we're teaching a new decision, it's not easy to do that without trying to say, look for this, look for this, these are the things you need to be looking for, this is what it means, and how do you actually do that? So one way we can do that is by using analogies. I spoke about analogies earlier. An analogy um, is basically a concept from one situation used um, for the task at hand um, without basically giving a load of conscious knowledge. So one of those things for making decision might be to attack triangles. So if you can find a triangle in the defense, it means there might be a, um, a weak shoulder somewhere and, um, and it'll be a good place to attack. And I'll show you an example of this. So someone shot out the line, there's the triangle, and the Sun Wolves attack it. I'd like to add a funny story to this. So that player who made um, the line break there is a guy called Yamashita Hiroshi. He was with the Chiefs in my first season there for a year. Didn't speak a word of English, so he had to have an interpreter with him the whole time. Um, he was a scrummaging prop. He, he wouldn't pass the ball. He wouldn't hardly ever run with the ball when he was at the Chiefs. Um, <clears throat> at our end of season dinner, he basically had a big highlights package because he was going back to Japan, and his highlights were the, the ball was overthrown at the line out. He was at the back. He caught it and got tackled, and that was 
are his highlights. Um, and the Sun Wolves against the Chiefs, he made two clean line breaks, and the Sun Wolves went on to win this game. So that's a funny story for you. Um, incidental learning. So sorry, um, with that analogy learning, obviously you can see that there's not a lot of conscious knowledge being given to the players. Look for players um, shooting out of the line. If there's, a, if there's a big gap between these players, it's just a simple analogy. Look for the triangles, attack the triangles. Um, so incidental learning um, is basically where learning occurs even though you don't specifically want um, to give the reason for um, the drill. So you don't, again, we don't want them to have a lot of conscious knowledge built up. Learning just happens automatically and it just happens as a byproduct of, uh, of a certain drill. Um, so I'll show this drill first and then I'll explain what I did with it. So I did this drill at, the, um, at Tunbridge. Um, so basically you have two players in the middle with these long foam noodle things, whatever you want to call them, four people in the middle. And obviously the reason for this, it makes decision making a lot harder because rather than having one meter either side where the defenders can grab you, they can now go probably three meters either side. So you have to get the ball out of your hands quickly. You have to manipulate those defenders um, and you have to read their body shapes a lot earlier. <clears throat> so I did this at Tunbridge and a player came up to me um, after the session. I was with another coach and he went, Seba, I didn't really understand like, what you were trying to get out of that drill and initially I thought have I messed up there and I was with another coach so it made me feel a bit stink but I then understood that this is exactly what we want we want our players to not completely understand the reason behind our drill as long as we can still see that progression so I, I knew that they progressed through the drill because they were starting to manipulate the defenders the attackers would get into the middle of them so they had two-sided attack they get the ball out of their hands quicker and they didn't know about it. They didn't have to think about it. So when they go back to um, performance under pressure, they're not gonna have that conscious knowledge to, to draw upon to affect their performance negatively. Distraction learning, another video that I found funny and I'll put it in. just find this bloke funny so I put this video in. Um, so this is another study that um, a guy called Nick Smeaton did from the University of Brighton when I was there. Um, he basically looked at um, a, a study where he wanted to improve players um, anticipation of tennis serves but he said the reason um, that the participants were doing the study was to improve their judgment of um, the tennis serve speed. So basically the, the participants would watch a load of tennis serves and they'd say 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, etc, etc. And they thought that was the reason for, um, for them taking part in the study, when actually it was to improve their, um, their judgment of where the serve was going to go. So they did this, um, watched, a load of watched a load of clips, said where they thought it was going to go, uh, said the speed they thought it was going to, said the speed it was. Um, but then they also did a test afterwards where they looked at um, like whether they could read whether the serve was going to their left or right, and their performance significantly improved in that, even though they weren't training it. So it's basically distraction learning saying that the main purpose of the task is to do this when actually this is working underneath at an unconscious level because they're not thinking about where the serve's going. They're purely thinking about how quick it is. Um, and if we think about the applications for, the, for rugby, if you're doing a four on three drill, you could say the main focus on this is your pass. So take the ball early, punch it through and just keep reinforcing the pass when actually that decision making is going to be working in the background in an unconscious way. So again, that's not going to um, detrimentally affect performance when we come under pressure and then the output so that's obviously all your job to make sure that um, they can perform the skill they can perform the skill under pressure some of the stuff that I've spoken about in that decision making stuff does still apply so avoid giving a lot of conscious um, conscious knowledge to the players because it's only going to detrimentally affect them when it comes to performance but I'm not going to speak about that too much today um, so performance analysis so I work as a performance analyst for England. Um, I basically get given projects by the coaches, so go away and look at this, look at this. I'll then provide a lot of numbers to say this is what this is showing, and I'll also provide videos to supplement that to say these are certain things. So what is um, um, performance analysis? So it's basically observing um, performance in different ways um, to enhance performance and improve coach decision making. And this can be through two ways. So either objective statistics, so that data analysis providing the numbers, but it can also be through visual, visual feedback as well. So it can be through um, yeah, providing videos and giving them to players, giving them to coaches to say, these are the things we want to improve or look at. So this is basically a, a very simple um, 
way performance analysis works. So performance takes place, whether it's um, training or a match, a coach will watch it, um, an analyst or coaches very much nowadays also analyze it as well off the field. That will then go back into the coaches where they'll think about um, what they need to do in the next training session, who, which players they need to speak to, etc. And then that would then go back into their training or into their matches. Um, and then it just works in that big cycle there. So why do we use performance analysis? So research has just shown that coaches can only pick up around 30% from observation alone. From my experience, I think it'd be even lower. I, I really struggle um, watching a game and then reporting back if someone said who scored it in this game. I couldn't always say who scored it. Um, so we use analysis to obviously build up that extra 70%. To put into context, straight after a game, you probably do five hours of analysis each before you provide um, a document to the coaches. And then that analysis would go on for the next couple of days to then uh, delve into certain things a bit deeper. So emojis, I've been using them throughout. Can anyone think why I've been using them? Yeah, exactly. So we've come to an age now where smartphones are taken over, aren't they? I don't know if, if any, of you else, <coughs> any of you have seen it, but on my phone, it tells me how long I've spent on it each day and how long I've spent on it on a, in a week. And when I first saw that, I, I was shocked at how much time I was spending on my phone. Um, <coughs> so the emojis has become a new language. Um, I use them a lot to try and convey messages um, to my girlfriend, to, to the team, etc. cetera. Um, um, yeah, nothing, nothing rude. Um, so we've got into an age where we're checking our phone every 12 minutes. So that's up to 150 times a day. Young people, it's been said by Ofcom, I don't know whether it's true or not, can't read sentences greater than 140 characters, which is obviously a Twitter reference. Um, so they've got very short attention spans. Um, if you go onto a website, it's said that it grabs your attention within two to four seconds. So if you're there for longer than two to four seconds and it hasn't grabbed your attention, then you're going to go off and you're going to try and find another website. Um, so that emo the emojis have come... Um, as a, as a new language, and for young people especially, to be able to provide really um, short information, just using emojis, maybe using just short videos or something like that, can grab their attention a lot more than giving them a detailed report of, this is what we did well at training, this is what we did poorly at training. So when to present that information, like, like I say, I, I know some of you um, video your games, I, I've been told that. Some of you um, video your training, some of you may not. This might just give you a bit of information if you do decide to um, to um, video them and provide that information, um, what you can use it and how you can use it. So for, before training, I use this for two ways in Tunbridge. Um, one is to explain drills that I'm going to do in the session to basically save me time. So <clears throat> this drill, for example, is a very short clip. So I'll show you there's one, two, three, four, five bags at the front, and then there's one at the back. And basically that bag will um, slot in somewhere in between those um, other bags. And the defenders here have to identify where this player is coming in and then all jam in based on where he is. So basically matching our defensive running lines. So just a quick example of it. So he came in there and then all these three players came in and left that man on the end, which would be our fullback's job. Um, um, so I could explain that drill in training, maybe take me two, three minutes, I could then do an example, take me another two minutes, and then that's five minutes of my drill gone. So if we can send this information out before, and if anyone has any questions then they can bring them up, then that's perfect and it saves me a lot of time. <clears throat> another way you can do it is you can have the beginning of the session where you'll go, these are the drills we're going to do, um, spend five, ten minutes going through everything, and then your training will run really um, smoothly th from that. But <clears throat> obviously this is very different to the Chiefs where they've got a full-time program so you, you have to obviously start being smart with um, your time allowances with your players and um, how much information you can get into them another reason I'll, I'll do it um, before training is to try and show a picture of what we're trying to achieve um, and give a really clear example rather than stopping it and saying oh that was a good example and talking through it again and, and using too much time so this is just an example of um, our alignment in defense and making sure we have square shoulders so we don't have weak shoulders for people to step back in on so we've got inside shoulders shoulder alignment, they come up, really nice square shoulders, and then obviously they can make the tackle there. So I just send that out on WhatsApp while the guys are on the train on the way over, but while they're still at work, they can have a quick look, 30 seconds, right, I completely understand that, and then we'll go into it in training. During training, this is harder, but you can make it work if you, if you sort out the logistics. So what you can do is, for example, with scrums, you can do a number of scrums, you can video them, 
after each scrum, players can go and look at that scrum very quickly on an iPad, say, right, that was good, that wasn't so good, the connection between the props and the hookers wasn't great, and then they can go straight back into that next, um, next scrum, try and sort it out, go back, look at the video. So although it seems you're having less number of repetitions, there'll be better quality repetitions, so you might get better outcomes from it. Um, another way you can do it, again, even harder, is you can have group one doing a certain drill. Um, they'll do their set, they'll then go and watch the video of that set they've just done. While they're doing that, group two will do their set. They'll, um, group one will then go back in while group two watches the video. So you have to go round and round. It's not easy, but you can make it work. Um, Post-match, like obviously that's the, the sort of standard you think for performance analysis, um, what went well in the match, what didn't, and I, I just send out very simple um, <clears throat> videos out. I try and vary it between highlighting really good things that players have done um, to obviously positive reinforce that, and then obviously you get the vicarious reinforcement of other players saying, well, he got positively re reinforced for that and he did that well, I can do that as well, but then also give some negatives as well and go, this wasn't very good. Um, the important thing with giving the negatives is you need to set your stall out early and get that culture of yes I'm going to pick out things you didn't do very well it's not it's not personal um, we're, we're here to improve as a team and the important thing is to try not to pick out the same person every week try and vary it around the team so one player doesn't um, start feeling yeah, really bad about <clears throat> being wrong all the time so this is just a very short example um, where this player makes a good chop tackle reloads very quickly to get on his feet and then scans to see where he needs to be So very simple, that was our emphasis in the week. Show a quick example, positively reinforce it, and then we'll go into the next game, hopefully with um, better behaviors like this. So with performance analysis, I've got a full-time job. Tunbridge is something I do two times a week, uh, or three times a week if you include the game. Um, I don't have time to go through it massively. So if you can make it a collaborative process, it saves, like, obviously, you guys a huge amount of time. So if, if the players have access to the video, send them away and say, can you look at this? What did you think of this from the weekend's game? And then get them to feed back in. So <clears throat> at the Chiefs, we had three different groups, I believe. We had an attack group, a defense group, and a counter-attack group. And Every week they'd meet on a Monday, every single player within that group had um, uh, done their research on next week's opposition, they'd come in and go, these are the things that I think are really important. Save the analysts a lot of job, but also the players are really good at it, they're the ones out on the field, they understand the game, so try and get them involved. So one thing we use at Tunbridge is a piece of software called Coach Logic, which you can get online. It's not massively expensive, I don't believe, where basically you'll put your video on there and then players can um, cut certain clips. So they can go, right, I want to start my video here, end it here, and it might be just a video of them tackling or something like that. And then they can um, basically send that to certain players in a Facebook type way so they can say, at first 15 coaches, um, this is what I thought about this certain thing. So just before Christmas, halfway through the season, I said to the coaches, I think um, the players should really focus on what their strengths and weaknesses are, um, rather than us just constantly telling them. And then that just obviously gives a bit of onus on them. If you said this is weak, then you need to go and work on it yourself. Um, <clears throat> so we've got each player to give their main strength and their main weakness in attack, and the same thing on defence. So they have to cut videos and say, right, this is my defensive um, weakness. I'm too eager to tackle from a certain position. So basically shoots out up out of that line, creates that triangle that we spoke about earlier um, and that's what he thinks is key weaknesses and then we'd speak to him and say okay so how are you going to stop doing that um, and then also you can um, put a comment underneath so I just put a comment saying yeah very good I think this is probably one of your weaknesses there's a few other examples of it um, we'll work on it on training so what to measure so this is the main thing I get asked as a, as a performance analyst you, you work full-time you do all this analysis does it actually influence um, the, the players who go out there on, on the weekend and, and do the performance um, and my argument would always be yes as long as you do it right and you're measuring the right things there's <clears throat> something called paralysis by analysis where basically you can analyze a million things and because you've analyzed all of them you give all that information to the players and it won't be helpful to them because they've got too much information then um, so this is an example um, over in New Zealand a company called Opta um, they code all of this stuff so they'll basically like I say they'll do a timestamp where they'll go start the video here end it here and then they'll add a load of labels to it so for example brad shields here um, he made a carry i believe a positive gain line dominant carry um, in the attacking half in the middle of the pitch it led to a penalty um, which was not releasing 
and that's on the minimal side of it. Sometimes you'll have um, a video which you can barely see because it's got so many labels over the top of it. So companies will do so, so much analysis for you, but our job as analysts is to obviously pick out the key information, what, what is beneficial to us, what works for us, those are the things we're going to look at. Um, so what, what's important to your goals? So obviously with England, it's winning. So we want to know what, what are those metrics that um, those companies code are most aligned to us winning the game. <clears throat> and those are the things we're going to focus on mainly. Um, for you guys, it might be player improvement. So what things are most important for your, pl your players to improve? Um, and then those are the things that ideally you want to measure. You don't want to measure everything because I doubt you have the time. So something I, I do with Tunbridge and the same thing we do for England is we set a frame of reference. So rather than measure, measuring everything, we delimit the area and just have three key focuses for the game. So for example, this was one of our games uh, for Tunbridge near the end of the season. Um, it was do your job, so just an overarching theme. And one of the key things within that was zero missed tackles if everyone went in with that goal, although it's probably not completely attainable. Um, like it's, a, it's a great um, benchmark to strive for. Play with tempo, so make sure we have our rucks less than three seconds and have a dominant set piece, so 100% top quality ball from lineups and scrums. So those are then now, rather than looking at carries, breakdowns, kicking, um, etc, 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 we're going to look at three key things. So I'll go away and look at um, missed tackles, which I'll show you in a second. Someone else will go through, and if you, you don't have this analysis software, it's just tally charts, isn't it? You can just go through and go, right, that ruck was one, two, three, four, no, not um, less than three seconds, that ruck was one, two, and then you do a tally chart, and then you'll have a big load of data at the end of it. Um, um, and it just breaks it up really easily. So these are the tackle stats that I provide um, to our players. It doesn't take me long, it takes me 30 minutes or something, and then I'll give them based on the players um, how many tackles they made, how many they missed, and their completion percentage. This is for Tunbridge, it's, it's nowhere near the depth that you'd go into at the professional level, but this is really um, like beneficial for us, I, I feel. Um, and what I do with these green players here, is if um, a player made the most tackles in the game, I'll give them something tangible like a chocolate bar. It sounds stupid, they're 24 years old, but giving them a chocolate bar, they love it and it makes it so competitive and just having it and taking the, the mick out of your mate because he didn't get one is it, so helpful. And I'd also give out um, a chocolate bar if they had 100%, but only if they made more than three tackles because I'm, I'm not spending um, a load of money on chocolate bars if they made one tackle. Um, <coughs> And obviously the, the important thing to this is we're celebrating the success of, of those top players, but also those players who've got the lower percentages, they can see where they sit within the positional group and they'll go, well, that person who I'm fighting for a position with, he's making 100% of his tackles, I'm making 60% week on week. So I, I need to change something and that'll give them a kick up the arse to go and work on it in training. I've had players come up to me and go, why, is my tackle, why are my tackles that's really poor? I'll provide them with a few videos, we'll discuss it together and then we'll work on it in training. Um, and the important thing with this is obviously you can start getting a longitudinal thing. So week on week on week, are their tackle stats remaining consistent? Are they improving? Are they dropping off? And you can then give that information to the players. And obviously the important thing for the team is um, um, that team percentage, is it improving? Is it um, staying consistent? I'll just say one more thing before I go on to questions. Um, Oh yeah, and then the important thing when we get to um, our frame of reference, if you're constantly giving the same frame of reference and it's not leading to your goals, so I'm providing this frame of reference but we're not winning the game even though we're achieving these goals, then I've done something wrong. So it's not the player's fault, I've given the wrong frame of reference and then I need to change the frame of reference to make sure it um, aligns with our goal um, more strictly. That's me. Any questions? I do the first team. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yep. When you start with setting up the top team, is that a process that you go through as a collaborative or, I mean... For setting our goals? So you start, you come into it, say you've started with a team. Yep. Um, where can you start framing what your analysis becomes? Um, 
so, so like I say, it has to be based on what we think is important for our game. So we'd probably look at what sort of players we have and what sort of game plan we want to have. So it might be, um, for, for the case in Tunbridge, our backs are really strong. So we want to play a real tempo driven game. And then that would obviously lead into our analysis. These are the key things for us to play well and for us to win. Um, so these are the key things that we're going to measure. There's, there's a lot of stuff that like you can measure. Um, so you can measure stuff like how quickly they get off the floor. Do they get off the floor within three seconds? But that may not have an effect on your actual defensive performance. So I could spend hours and hours and hours doing it and it wouldn't have any effect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sorry, but I'm more, I'm more keen to know how to begin because we're going to do an annual class. Yeah. So how do you, you're coming from the minis and now we're going up to age group. Yeah. How do we set our goals and our parameters around the analysis that we do for that age group Yeah, that's a good question. Because I because I've never worked in that age group, it's really hard for me to how did envisage. You start when you were at Tunbridge, when you came in at Tunbridge, how did you start your analysis? Was it done before you? Or did you start that or there was people doing it beforehand and they basically tried to make it a collaborative process using that and they try and have certain players looking at certain things. Um, it is what, did change, what did you change around? Uh, mainly by giving like data driven stuff so giving those numbers to the players to say these are some key things that you did well that you didn't do well these are key things that we did as a team that was good and, and not good um, for, for the under 12s I'd assume that it'd be video based stuff and it could just be this week we want to look at um, the number 10 getting the ball out of their hands and then just show 10 examples of him getting the ball out of his hands and a positive response that led on from that and then you can give really clear um, like outcomes based on your directives okay um, as quick as it is, thank you how do you avoid the whole thing becoming too formulaic because you, there's an observation mm -hmm. an awful lot of sides from like national to upwards play a very similar game mm -hmm. and I guess the in their players' minds, they're going, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Yep. Um, so I, I suppose the key thing is, is to not um, punish mistakes. So obviously if people do break system because they've seen something, you can obviously question them and go, what did you see? Okay, if you did see that, then that's fine. I, I don't have your eyes. Um, if you can see, see something, then do it. So for example, with our castle call, although the, the directive is to avoid competing at the breakdown, if you see something, I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to say you shouldn't have gone over the breakdown if you saw a clear opportunity, even if it led to a penalty. So I think it has to be um, an open environment where there's people are allowed to express themselves. Yeah, experience in New Zealand, uh, the team's just so much better at not playing from there, I think. Definitely, yeah. And it feels like they need to be critical from there. Yeah. Any observations why that? Um, so, so one of the key things is, within um, New Zealand rugby, they've got the idea of they, they, they have to have structure, but they, they want to have that structure that, to then create the chaos, so to create those opportunities where they can express themselves and they can do what's in front of them. Um, I think with England, they have that structure, they'll then create those broken opportunities, but they'll be really quick to get back into structure afterwards. So it's allowing them to, if it is um, unstructured, continue with that unstructured and, and try and force it. Yep. Go yep. Yeah. 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 That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Say that again, sorry. <laughs> Forwards or backs? Um, from my experience and. Darren might know who I'm talking about. I find it mainly with the forwards. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's a general thing because some of the forwards are great. I think some of them... I, I, I don't know. I don't, think, I don't think you can split it. I think it's purely individual-based. There's, there's some players who, who think they have all the answers. And myself, a skinny, skinny guy coming in, haven't played at the level they've played at, and I'm open with that. Um, I think some people do kind of go, well, why are you telling me this? I, I know it. I, I'm playing at this level. You're not playing at this level. And I, I just have to understand that. I can give them all the coaching I can, but I can only do what I can do. 
um, trying to build a really good rapport with them and trying to say like I, I completely ad, um, am open with my um, lack of playing at that level I, I'm not going to pretend like I'm something I'm not I'll be completely honest with them and I'll try and give them maybe examples of um, levels slightly higher than them and go look you're probably better than this player he's playing in that one he's playing in championship but your issues are this he might agree he might not agree but try and give him some sort of goal to, to work towards that, that's something I found beneficial. Right, I'll have to interject on that. Yeah, that's fine.